everybody. Oh, let me just check that. Yeah, I, I, I'm Andy Bates. I'm an executive member of the Labour Housing Group. Uh, delighted to introduce Alex Steiner uh, tonight. Alex is a uh, senior housing researcher uh, for the New Economic Foundation. So, some of you might remember that his boss, Mayetta, came and gave a, an excellent in conversation with us uh, about a year or so ago. Um, Alex has been involved recently in two excellent publications uh, that, that he's going to share with us. So what, what one was Beyond New Build, which is about repurposing private sector accommodation as, so, as social housing. And obviously Alex will tell us a lot more about that. And also the collective right to buy, and also his paper on the collective right to buy. Um, Alex is a former councillor. Uh, whenever Alex and I talk, so he's a late Orient fan, I'm a Walsall fan, and we always drift off to, and start talking about football. So if that ha if that happens tonight, just just stop us. Uh, we we are going for a different format tonight, so we thought we better kind of refresh uh, the in conversation because we've been going for about three years, and so, some of you might remember we started this off during during COVID. Um, so I'm going to ask Alex, Alex some questions. Uh, we'll do that for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll just throw it out for questions. And um, we'll aim, if people haven't had tea, we'll, we'll aim for you um, to be having your tea in about in about an hour's time. So, Alex, if, if I can bowl you a soft question to start off with and just ask you to talk about, uh, about the housing crisis. And, and there's a lot of people on here who love statistics, so you can be as statty as you want to. For oh, well, that's great. Thanks, Andy. And thank, thanks for that introduction. It's really, really good to, to be here and speak to you all. Um, my NEF hat, I should say, uh, my New Economics Foundation hat is squarely on my head. And my um, Labour Party membership hat is kind of somewhere on the other side of the room. And I can see it and pick it up, but I'll be very clear if I do uh, switch my hats for anyone who's from the Charity Commission in the room. Um, so... Um, your question, Andy, <laughs> of um, yeah. where where we are in the housing crisis and what 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 kind of situation we find ourselves in, it it's it's it, I'm going to mix my metaphors here. Um, every every light on the dashboard is flashing red. Every single metric by which you might judge a functional housing system um, is clearly not in place. We have you, you don't need me to kind of go through it line by line because many of you will not only know about this stuff because you're interested but also experience it so you don't need me to tell you but we know that rents are soaring we know that prices are stagnating some kind of slightly unexpected news in the last couple of weeks about maybe it's not stagnating as much as everybody thought but we're certainly not getting the runaway prices that we saw during the stamp duty freeze immediately um, after the covid pandemic developers aren't building <clears throat> so supply is falling and because of the model that we have of cross-subsidising social housing supply, um, that I'm sure you will all be familiar with, the Section 106 grant making, the number of social homes, um, we can also expect that to be falling quite significantly as well. Um, we've got a huge amount of people with negative equity, particularly those who've taken out help to buy um, loans over the last few years. We all know the situation with mold damp etc that's not getting better anytime soon and the number of people taking up government what 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 limited government grants there are for this kind of stuff just just isn't really happening so every 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 kind of as you know and I've, I've, that, that's only a few we could i could go on um overcrowding um you know the, the the kind of inequitable distribution of our homes by generation you know race class you don't you don't need to go on about it we all know just how bad it is that what I've just described has been the case for a while. Um, I think it's fair to say that it's intensified um, over the last 12 months or so, particularly since interest rates rose. Because with those rising interest rates, um, and the data on this is a bit sketchy, um, mostly non-available, and there are lots of time lags with it. But the data that is available does suggest that some landlords, because of those interest rate rises, are leaving the housing market. They are wanting to sell, um, particularly those who have borrowed quite a lot to become landlords. They tend to own a small number of properties. Um, they probably are selling. And that is meaning that, that um, those people who are renting from them 
have to find a new home, which is driving homelessness, particularly in an era of high rents where they're going on Zoopla and finding out that actually to rent somewhere in the same area is costing them up to 15, 20, 25 percent more than it was. So that is causing an immediate problem of homelessness, which local authorities are having to deal with. Um, and as we all know, building a new social home takes years and years and years. Um, and that's part of the reason why we've got, I guess, the kind of icing along the cake of the current crisis is that we've got a departmental underspend. So last year, you may have, some of you may have read, there was a two, roughly £2 billion underspend from the department for levelling up, money they weren't able to get out the door that should have been spent on building new social homes and the accompanying infrastructure, which because developers aren't particularly interested in building at the moment, where we've got stagnating house prices, the money was returned back to the Treasury. Now, that is absolutely mad um, because the only way out of this is by building new social homes. Um, so that's the kind of icing on the cake of, of the current crisis, I would suggest. I think you're on mute, Andy. But yeah, thanks, Alex. We, we, we're all desperately hoping oh. for a Labour government, but it's a Labour government that's going to walk into a housing crisis and, and, and also a crashed economy. So I, I, I know your work's been focusing on the kind of high impact, uh, lower expenditure solutions. So can, can, can you start to talk about, talk to us about those, please? Yeah, so I think there's there's kind of there's quite a long list of things that an incoming Labour government would be interested in and want to do. And to be fair, they've announced quite a lot of this stuff already. And recently at conference, there was a kind of avalanche of announcements. Um, I think, you know, from my perspective, uh, they're, they're all good. They're all kind of saying the right things. Um, we were discussing uh, on the call before most of you joined. Um, most of them don't cost the exchequer anything. Um, which is obviously particularly attractive, I think, to the to the front bench at the moment, given the the, the restraints within which um, they're wanting to operate in regards to the fiscal rules and so forth. Um, but things like abolishing hope value, for example, um, has the potential to be absolutely transformative. I think there was some work done by Civitas, another think tank from a few years ago, suggesting that hope value adds about 38 percent on to the cost of building a new social home. So if you get rid of that, which some of which has happened through the levelling up bill, which is now the levelling up act, but Labour have said that they're going to abolish the whole thing. If you do that, you're on a much better starting point than where you are currently, whereby local authorities are having to pay through the nose for um, for land based on the hope value rather than the agricultural value. So Alex, some people will know about hope value, some people won't. So can you can you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. So that's so hope value is is um, something that's been in place as a result of the 1961 Land Compensation Act, um, which was effectively what killed off the new towns. Um, so what that means is that if a local authority or frankly, any public authority, but this applies particularly to local authorities, want to purchase land on which to build homes, they don't pay what the land is worth in its current situation. They pay the hope value of what that land may be worth if it's got homes, infrastructure, et cetera, built on it, which is nine, 99 times out of 100, significantly more than what it would be in its current value. So as I said, it adds about 38% on of costs on top of what, what would otherwise be the case for building a new social home. So what it also does is that if you get rid of that, which is what Labour are proposing to do and which the government have made some steps towards doing, all of which is welcome, but if you get rid of it, what it means is that instead the local authority will be the ones who capture that up that increasing in land value and what that means is then that their asset book has swollen the value of their assets has gone up with capturing the value of that land so instead of spending the money they're actually the ones to receive it so it's called land value capture and what that means is that their asset books will swell once, once they start doing this and the idea is that once you if you combine that with some serious capital grant funding you get this kind of virtuous kind of circle of local authorities borrowing which they now can do thanks to the reforms that Theresa May brought in borrowing 
to build to to buy land which they can then capture the value of build they've got a bigger asset book means they can borrow more advantageously on better rates and the, the, the kind of virtuous circle continues so hope value is one thing which which labor have announced which is absolutely fantastic and and bang on the money alex just before you leave that do you, do you see a return of new terms coming that way absolutely i think there's no there's there's there, there's no way in which to deliver anything like the ambition that the party have talked about without new towns and that's why when when angela rayner at the start of conference was was making lots of really good noises about prioritizing social and affordable housing um she was talking about um, enabling councils to to buy homes as well as build which is something that we've been working on at the new economics foundation and which is the subject of one of the papers in the chat um all of that was good and what Keir starmer said in his leader speech was was very much you know we're going to have new towns and that's going to be one of the key mechanisms through which we deliver these new homes now all of that sounds good um new towns were the single most effective means by which we overcame the last housing crisis um at the end of the second world war when we had you know um most of our inner cities completely demolished lots of homeless people etc we, we built new towns and we cleared the slums and we built new towns we built new towns through um development corporations by really generous government grants and long-term thinking because it cost the exchequer to put up the cash for that but the exchequer did it because there was a long-term kind of plan to see through the building of these towns which takes donkeys right you, you wouldn't expect a new town to just pop up it takes years i think the the, the last loans um that were finally paid back to the exchequer for Milton Keynes, I think, relatively recently. So it does take decades and decades. Um, that was one of the transformative things that kind of created, you know, that, that, that drove the kind of golden era of, of, of house building after the Second World War. We're not going to be able to do that kind of thing and match the ambition that, that Keir Starmer is talking about, which is all completely welcome. We're not going to be able to do that without new towns. The thing with new towns um, and where we are going to have to be a bit nimble footed about about what we think our housing system should look like is that new towns almost by definition will need to be built in areas where there's with high demand. So you're not just going to, for example, just build a new town in the middle of the Scottish Highlands, right, where it's very beautiful and you'd have lots of problems in that respect. But no, yeah. very few people want to live there. Um, you're going to concentrate them in the southeast of England primarily because that's where you get the most economic bang for your buck. And that's where most people want to live. Now, that's not to say there isn't a slightly different housing crisis in other parts of the country. So, for example, in the northeast of England, you have low housing demand. Um, you have a huge amount of um, derelict, empty, improperly used homes that need a retrofit that can be used to regenerate a town. It's different issues requiring different solutions so towns new towns are really really important for addressing kind of high demand parts of the country where i'm thinking london and the southeast particularly you know which is what happened after the second world war um but the solution where there's low demand is going to have to be different okay but per perfectly timed alex so t tell us about the solution where there's low demand the the, the collective right to buy yeah, no, that so we, we wrote a paper again, it's in the it's in the, the chat. Um so that's a to take a step back, what's the problem that we have in a lot of our kind of left behind, so-called left behind areas, the kind of areas that may have been in the red wall or what it the so-called red wall, um, you know, areas of the northeast, the northwest, etc., where you've got lots of empty, a disproportionate amount of empty properties. You've got low rental income for landlords, but we are the, the evidence suggests that actually there's still quite a lot of landlord activity in those areas. They're still buying up properties. The reason for that is because the property prices are so low in a lot of these towns. And they're not normally the big cities. So I'm not thinking Newcastle. I'm thinking more the kind of towns surrounding Newcastle, um, you know, areas in which um, there is that low demand. Um, you've got a lot of empty homes and you've got a lot of portfolio landlords who have quite big um, property holdings, um, often buying in cash, um, able to 
flex quite a lot of muscle when you've got high interest rates because if you're buying in cash you don't have to worry about interest rates everybody else has to worry about interest rates councils do if they want to buy the homes you don't you can just come in with your cash and undercut everybody um what's tending to happen is that because property prices are so low there their rental yield is still quite high so it's still an attractive financial investment um, if you are a buy-to-let landlord and you've got housing benefit rates which means that actually you've got quite quite a stable income on your rent so what we're seeing we think is still quite a lot of landlord activity in those areas and because a lot of the rents in those areas tend to be pretty much limited there's there's a de facto ceiling on the amount of rent a landlord can charge on that property what that means is the landlord doesn't really have an incentive to invest and improve the the property because they're not going to get a higher rent on it so that's why you see a lot of really poor quality private rented sector homes in those kind of left behind areas and what our paper calls for is for extra cash um and the lifting of the restrictions on local authorities to be able to buy up these homes retrofit them and let them out to local people and also for community-led housing organizations to do that work as well so as well as local authorities which we all know about there are and some of you may know about these, we've got a kind of a healthy ecosystem of community led housing groups in a lot of these kind of left behind areas. They're not local authorities. They can't bid for Homes England grants. They're finding it very tough at the moment because they're, as I said, they're, they're kind of they're going to that property auction to buy a new home to house a home, local ham, homeless family in. And they're finding that the buy to let landlord has come along and, and, and swept away the board. So what the, what our paper argues for is that cash, that flexibility around homes and grant making, but also first buyer rights for them. So that if um, if a so we, we currently have kind of a community asset rights whereby you know if there is an asset of community value, um, a local community group can have first buyer rights on just extend that to, to housing. Um, and so if I'm a local community group or a local authority, if I had this so-called community right to buy, I would have first dibs on it for a set period. And the idea is basically just to kind of level the playing field a little bit. Yeah, thanks, Alex. I'm starting to see questions coming up, coming up on the chat, which we will we will deal with. Um, I, I wanted to, to ask you about this idea of repurposing properties in the in the bottom end of the private rented sector and, and, and enabling them to be taken over either by social landlords, councils, or, as you're saying, community groups. So if, if you can tell us more about that proposal, Alex. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it's the kind of thing that a lot of councils are already doing. Um, I, you know it's 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 something which is quite difficult for local councils to do so where the situation that i described at the start whereby we've got um rising rents we've still got section 21 no fault eviction notices on the books homelessness is increasing so more and more people are turning up at the council door saying can you can you discharge your statutory housing duties to me and rehouse me please um that's obviously an increasingly untenable situation for a lot of councils who don't have the in-house stock to place people in and then they don't have the in-house temporary accommodation to place people in so that's why we're seeing increased use of bbs hostels worst of all nightly paid accommodation which is exorbitantly expensive for local authorities so we're seeing that go up and up and up instead what we can do given that we've got we did have two billion quid just sloshing around at the department, which has now gone back to the treasury, why not give it to those councils, make it easier for those councils who are desperate to deal with the homelessness problem that they've got, let them use that cash, take it off the hands of those landlords who at the moment, as I said at the start, there are there are a number of landlords who want to sell at the moment. Give it to councils, give them a bit of a retrofit grant alongside that, let them buy the place off the landlord who wants to sell, do it up so it meets the decent home standard, and there you go. Your council has increased the size of its asset book. It's got more, it owns more assets. It's throwing less money at bad, um, really poor quality temporary accommodation in the private rented sector, which is driving a lot of councils to the brink at the moment. There's been some pretty eye-watering stories over the last month or so about the real 
financial hardship that councils are facing as a result of this temporary uh, the, the homelessness crisis that we've got at the moment. So the, 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 there's a kind of hard edge kind of urgency to this stuff. And if I can take your question just one step further, one of the things that I will be looking for at the budget next week um, will be whether the Chancellor uprates the local housing allowance. Um, so for those of you who don't know, that's the rate which has been frozen since 2020 at 2019 levels by which housing benefit is given to, to tenants in the private rented sector. So it's been frozen for the last three years while rents have gone through the roof. And that's one of the things that's driving homelessness. But it's also one of the things that's pushing the burden onto councils because they then have to meet the diff when when they when they place a family in temporary accommodation in the private rented sector, they have to meet the different the financial costs of between the rent and what they get in, in LHA. So it's costing council taxpayers and councils. So I'm actually slightly, I would I wouldn't say optimistic, but somewhere between confident and less than confident <laughs> that, that, that the Chancellor may do something on this um, in the budget next week. So I think it's something for us all to keep our eyes on. Yeah, that, that's that's really interesting, Alex. So we, we, we came and talked to you about work we're doing on the number of people in temporary accommodation and how, how you can how you can reduce the cost and, and improve the quality of that. And, and every expert we talked we talked to mentioned local mentioned the, the, the circle between cutting the, the local housing allowance uh, the, sorry the local housing allowance and the and the increase in homelessness mm. we, we we specifically talked to you about an, an incoming labor government would face the housing crisis it would face 150 people in 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 temporary accommodation and, and so we started to talk to you about how you could kind of make a uh, what would be a quick reaction to that do you, do you want to talk some more yeah. some more to that alex yeah absolutely i mean the quick win is that i, I know i keep on talking about it but it is it is a it is a scandal that two billion quid that's just gone back to the treasury um what one of the one of the things which i think um i took a lot of comfort from from what Matthew Pennycook was saying at, at Labour Party conference, I basically followed him around for three days. Um, I, I've attended every um, every fringe event that he spoke at, and he kept on saying this, and I was very glad to hear it. That an incoming Labour government will find whatever means and do whatever means necessary to get that money out the door. As I said, give it, to, make it easier for councils to access that cash. Let them spend it on homes that landlords want to sell. Let them provide it as temporary accommodation to the rising number of homeless families. Um, and that's something to, to kind of get the cogs turning, as it were. The, the difficulty that, you you know, that that's a holding position. The difficulty is that that doesn't get you anywhere near the scale of the ambition, which, as Angela Rayner has been talking about, is a new generation of social housing basically go to, rolling back the years to the golden post post war era delivering 300,000 homes a year as Keir Starmer was saying you're not going to get anywhere close to that unless you've got local authorities building in the way in which they were after the second world war and that's a, all everything i just described there is frankly different set of questions um which is going to be the second i would suggest set of priorities for them over the medium and long 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 term the initial situation that you've just described very eloquently Andy is what the heck are we going to do with rising homelessness councils facing financial bankruptcy and more and more homelessness and a property in uh, uh, developers who aren't building the homes that we need to address this that's tough can, can I, yeah can, can I throw, throw a, ch a challenge at you so we, we had a meeting with a guy called Steve Cowens who's been tasked by the leadership to lead a commission on private rent on the private rented sector. And we said, we, we know this guy, Alex Steiner from the NEF, he's got this great idea on, rep on repurposing. And then Steve's response was the last thing that um, cash strapped local authorities would want is a lot of really poor private rented accommodation. What, what should we have said to him? No, I, look, I, I think, um, 
I mean, I've spoken to Steve about this as well. Um, that wasn't what he said to me. Um, oh, right, okay. I suggest he had been a bit mischievous. Uh, look, different local authorities will take different approaches. I know that lots of local authorities are already doing this, I should say. So so I, I, I currently live in the London Borough of Enfield. Um, I know that my council, my local authority are doing this kind of thing because they're desperate to stop throwing um, good money at bad landlords to house their most vulnerable people, their most vulnerable families in really crap accommodation. They're fed up with it. They want they want something to show for their money. That something could be an asset. Now, I'm not saying that every local authority should go and deliberately pick the worst quality home they can find and think, oh, this is a retrofit challenge. Let's let's do that. I'm not suggesting they do that. They have to do whatever they think they need to do to address the immediate problem they've got on their doorstep, which is primarily homelessness. Um, what I will say is that the government should be helping them to do that, to buy the home. It should also be helping them to take on the worst of those properties, if that's what they want to do to retrofit them. Um, the retrofit thing for me is a kind of, if I'm honest, it's a secondary kind of set of issues. And I completely understand why a local authority would look at some of these properties and just think, why the hell would we buy that? We'll buy one elsewhere. And that's fine. Um, just as long as they're given the means by which to to buy the homes, to place the homeless families in, to get the kind of oil tanker moving in the right direction. OK, the, the pressure is build, building up in the chat. So what, one final question, and I, I guess the, the last piece of the jigsaw is that the, there's a lot of council housing that's now 70 years old. And on uh, and on the verge of obsolete obsolescence and definitely needs huge investment in terms of in terms of energy efficiency and and building safety. Not 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 something I've seen you write about, Alex. But what what, what can we do about that? Yeah, well, look, it, it's it's a really tough nut to crack. Um, you know, most council homes or a lot of council homes were built to really good standards, really high standards, um, and they've lasted a, a good chunk of time. Um, but look, this isn't a completely different problem to that which the previous Labour government inherited um, in the late 90s. Huge backlog of repairs that, that, that was attempted to be resolved through the decent homes standard, which made huge headway. You know, um, you, you can argue, you can have a debate now about whether it was right to link that to, um, you know, the, the, the kind of almos and, and the, the strings that were attached with decent homes money. But no one can deny the huge inroads it made into improving the quality of that stock. Um, there is a there are pots of money out there for local authorities to, to be doing this. You've got the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund. Again, does it go far enough? Probably not. I think the the kind of view that I've obtained from from others, and as you said, Andy, it's not something that I've done a particular you know yeah, amount yeah. of research in but, but the view i've i've obtained from a few people is that the the to access those grants is very very difficult um for for yes. local yeah. and, yeah, associations. and the obvious point is just make it easier and um, whether that's possible or not i don't know but but just get the money out the door um and this is one of the number of challenges that local authorities and housing associations are facing just to kind of keep keep standing still, let alone do what we want them to do to build 90,000 social homes a year. They've got huge problems with the quality of their existing stock, particularly street yeah, properties, yeah. those underinvested. They've got to um, uh, improve the or, or, or resolve the fire remediation, fire safety remediation issues from the following Grenfell and the Building Safety Act. Um, and at the same time, we're asking them to build new homes. And at the same time, um, there's yeah. a cap on the rental income. Um, which, you know, was a reasonable step for the government to take um, because it's about balancing the needs of tenants with with social landlords. But you can't deny it's not had an impact on their revenue stream to be able to get them to do the stuff that we want them to do. Um, so it's not easy. It's a mess. No, you, you, you're right, Alex. So I was in a meeting yesterday talking about the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund. And, and councils are handing the, the, some of the money back because the, because the conditions are just just impossible for them. And what one of the things I heard at the fringe meeting is not that there's going to be lots of extra cash from Labour, but there will be. But they will remove the conditions. They will kind of devolve, devolve spend it. They will devolve um, 
spending responsibility and the, also in the kind of stupidity of, of the competitive bidding process. So do, do, just, I mean, just before we throw it open to questions, do, 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 do you want to, do you want to kind of address that? Yeah, I think it's really important. And, and as I said, it's kind of, it's, it's, the, the, it feels as though from all the things that were announced at conference, it was everything you could announce, which is good without additional cash. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and getting the and 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 in a way that's right because at the moment, as much as I would love to see the affordable homes program quadruple in size, there literally is no point at the moment because there's a departmental underspend. So in a way, that's a really theoretical debate for now. Mm-hmm. It's a real debate for the next affordable homes program from 2026, when hopefully we're not quite in the same situation then as we are now. But in order to get there, the money needs to get out the door. Developers need to start building again. The state can play a counter cyclical role as it has done in the past in getting that going. Um, the it's, it, Both parties have done this in the past. So Gordon Brown did it immediately after the global financial crisis. They gave cash to lots of housing associations to buy up homes that wouldn't otherwise be sold. John Major did it in the early 90s. Yeah. Um, all of that needs to happen. The wheels need to cut kind of the wheels of the... I'm really mixing my metaphors. In. The, the oil tanker needs to be turned around and pushed in the right direction. Then we can start talking about how much more we need to fund um, the Affordable Homes Programme to deliver 90,000 social homes a year, which is the only long-term sort of sustainable solution out of it. But for now, it's about making sure that money gets out of, out of Whitehall as soon as possible. Local authorities and housing associations have the cash that they need to do what they want to do. Thanks, Alex. The, the, the other backlog we've got is questions in, in the chat. So if, if we take if we take them in the order that they appear. So, uh, Peter, you, you, you had a question for Alex. Yeah, I was just uh, sorry. I was just uh, on your points with um, new towns. Uh, one of the things that we haven't done very well uh, is to look at how we can increase the densification of existing cities, because particularly around transport nodes, et cetera, they, clearly we can deliver a lot more housing more sustainably because of the transport links, higher urban density, et cetera. And I was just wondering what your views on that rather than eating up further green land was. And further to that, obviously one of the, the leading examples of that is the Melbourne city development where they've looked at that. I mean, it hasn't been very well implemented because they're relying on trams which can't run because of all the, the traffic that's there but we have a better transport systems for example in london which can support that yeah no interesting points i mean um, melbourne is one of the most wonderful cities in the world so um i don't want to kind of um brief against melbourne but um <laughs> i think uh and and is and is a very you know a, a, a good pl- I, I i've spent about six to nine months there is is a good place to live um I would say each we don't just have one housing crisis. We've got multiple housing crises, crises impacting in different parts of the country in different ways. Are there parts of the country where that can be densified and urban areas that can be densified? Absolutely. Um, can it happen everywhere? Absolutely not. I see we've got um, Councillor Mick Sullivan on the call. Uh, Mick O'Sullivan, Mick, Mick and I know each other from our Islington days. There aren't many parts of Islington where you can do um uh there, there are little car parks every now and again that you can infill but there isn't a huge amount of space there um you, you sorry my, my point wasn't about taking finding new space was taking existing space and allowing for higher density urbanization in, in the in the model yeah. of the uh, melbourne one which can then produce that densification that you need because yeah, it's not but, allowed at the moment yeah for for because of planning regulation yeah i mean look I, uh, where where is suitable yes I think that the reality is, though, we're not going to get close to the scale that we need to do this on unless we are um, building in new towns and building new places. And um, I think Keir Starmer was absolutely right to talk about um, building on the so-called green belt, if I'm honest. Um, I think that a lot of it isn't particularly beautiful. Um, I think that there are lots of parts of that green belt that are perfectly ripe for development and do have good transport and infrastructure links. Um, I think that one of the advantages, well, one of the many advantages of of building new towns is that um, you can 
build the place that you want it to be with an almost blank sheet of paper, notwithstanding the environmental and ecological um, kind of limitations of that. And one of the advantages of doing that as well is that you can, although you know it is a carbon, we haven't really talked about green stuff um, and and the the environment. Um, it you know everything that we're describing is a carbon intensive process. You do have to balance that against the country's needs to meet net zero is net zero obligations by twenty fifty. If you're building new towns, at first glance you think, well, you Is it just me that's lost, Alex, or is everybody else? Me too. Yeah, it's Same. Just, just paused. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I hope, hopefully we, we're just about to get Alex Transport back. use gives people everything they need, et cetera, et cetera. So there are lots of things you can do. Um, to, to... Alex, we're having difficulty... Kind of receiving not you. necessarily blow the carbon budget by building these new towns. Okay, was was there enough of an answer there, Peter? Hopefully there yeah. was. So, uh, Mervyn, a lot more debate on that you, one. <laughs> yeah, uh, Mervyn, do, do you want to jump in with your question? Yes, I mean, I'm interested in going back to what used to be called rehabilitation of properties, but a particular angle that interests me is the uh, empty. Uh, shops and commercial premises on our high streets and i did some work on uh, repurposing those uh, for homeless people who like to live in the center of towns and near uh, uh, communication hubs and was completely stymied by the planners who hate permitted development rights and will stand uh, as strongly as they possibly can against any attempt to foreshorten the high streets on our uh, little towns what can we do about that um thanks Mervyn I'm sorry I, I think I did drop off the call and I missed the first part of your yeah. question but I think I can see it in the chat as well just about repurposing vacant commercial property um yeah. well I, I I think it's important to do that kind of thing um if it's appropriate I mean there's a lot of commercial property which is just completely inappropriate and will never be appropriate to to, to house people in um but you know there will be there will be places where you can where you can do that i think that one of the things that i've found when i've been doing the work that i've been doing on basically repurposing existing buildings um is that it all sounds good it all sounds logical of course we should do this kind of thing where it's appropriate does it solve the housing crisis in and of itself no it doesn't um I, i'm not saying it's not important it's one of 50 things we need to do is you know probably in the top 15 20 of those things um ultimately um it's all good but the only way we're going to get out of this is by building lots more social homes um and and new places social housing being at the heart of those new places making sure they're sustainable good transport links infrastructure etc um but no where, where appropriate actually we should be repurposing vacant commercial property where appropriate Mervyn, it's, it's worth you talking to the leader of Stafford Borough Council, where we, we're in power for the first time in in, in a generation. So they, they, they've got to plan to regenerate the fairly sad northern end of the town and, 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 and turn it into emergency accommodation, ex exactly how you talk, exactly how you're, you're describing it. Uh, so, Carl, you, you, you had a question. Oh, yeah. Um, and on that point, you know, I was just thinking where well, I'm from Plymouth, you know, there's many town centres that no longer need to be the size that they were. But you're right. You need to do it thoughtfully, don't you? Anyway, um, I was talking, I've been to, you know, a number of planning committee meetings as or, you know, viewed them online as as uh, some housing interested people do go to them. And you always get these people going on when there's these new developments going. There's only 10 percent family housing in this or something like that and I look at them and they're you know really dense you know often really dense places in London and other places like that they're not really suitable for for family housing so I this is why I quite like this idea often our London you know, I'm, I'm quite London specific on this so I do apologize um a lot of London there's a lot of housing in London that's brilliant for families that have been turned into 
really poor quality hate to mows, which I quite, this is why I quite like this idea. But I think everything comes down to, and you've kind of mentioned it constantly, is money. And, and whether that is as financially viable to, to, to pick off properties one by one, as opposed to building on on mass um social or unaffordable housing um and another kind of key question on top of that is you know we both want the lha rates to go up to, to afford things and we also want to build social housing and affordable housing so that people don't need to be on lha but that means in a short you know for the first few years you know spending money on ha social housing saves you money in the long run because of lha but you've got a double spend at the beginning haven't you yeah, no, they're the two very, very good points, and I completely agree. So the first, the first point about um, whether the Treasury will go in for these kind of um, basically mass social housing acquisitions, um, the answer is up until now, no. <laughs> and the the reason for that is because every time it goes into the Treasury, it doesn't pass the Green Book analysis. There isn't enough economic return. Um, particularly in high cost areas like like London. Now, the economic return in other parts of the country where you've got low property prices, et cetera, is a lot better. We, we at the New Economics Foundation did originally intend to do some modeling on what, what, what you could get, what was the bang for your buck in different parts of the country. But ultimately, um, I think we kind of erred away, shied away from that actually, because the results weren't quite as bad as we thought they were going to be, but they still weren't great. The Treasury is the Treasury is the Treasury and will only give money unless um, uh, Rachel Reeves is intended to con you know, conduct her chancellorship in a fundamentally different way to all of her predecessors, which we would I, I would welcome. Um, but I would say, you know, we'll, we'll have to wait for that if, if and when that does happen. But but what her officials will want to see is the economic return on any investment in, in, in anything, let alone housing and social housing. Um, that is why one of the pieces of work that we're now going to do at the New Economics Foundation, we're hoping to partner with Shelter on this, is to do the kind of economic case. So what is the bang for your buck, HM Treasury, for investing? Um, basically, you know, to get 90,000 social homes a year, you're going to pretty much have to quadruple the affordable homes programme. That is a huge financial investment in any time, let alone now. Um, if you're going to ask um, any government to prioritise that, it's reasonable to ask, well, what are the economic returns? And actually, the economic returns are pretty good. Um, it's about £2.70 for every pound you spend. Um, so it's good. Um, I think we're going to kind of try to lay out that case. Um, and that does tie in with your second point about essentially the double spend at the start. And that is absolutely right. The The, the savings that you get from reduced housing benefit reduced temporary accommodation costs. And also there's other, other kind of associated costs of this. So increased health expenditure, increased education expenditure, lots and lots of kind of hidden um, costs of rising homelessness. Um, that takes time. It takes time to feed through into the system and takes time for the exchequer to recoup those costs. That's why anything in this space has to be about long-term thinking. And that's a really tough sell to any politician who wants to get re-elected. That's just a really tough sell. I'm not trying to say that, you know, it's not unreasonable that they think in five-year cycles and that Treasury officials think in three-year spending cycles. But what we need to do is kind of channel our uh, the kind of mindset of our predecessors in the post-war period and think, okay, well, how do we do this in a long-term way? That's really the only way that we're going to get out of out of this mess and overcome that double hit that you said at the start. Uh, Paul Martin? Oh, he's still on mute at the moment, Paul. Thanks, Andy, sorry. If a Labour government adopted every initiative we might propose today, will there be enough of a skilled workforce and building materials to deliver it? I'm a big fan or non-fan of the Addison Act of 1919, which has all horrible parallels with today. And it wasn't at all a bad idea and it did good stuff, but it didn't really succeed because of those two reasons. That's absolutely right. The answer to your question is no. 
um, which is <laughs> which, which is one thing that we haven't covered, but you're absolutely right to raise it. Um, it's something which governments can encourage through various kind of policy levers. Um, we're in a really bad situation with this at the moment. And it's not just house building. It's also retrofit where this is a yeah. huge problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's not something that I am an expert in, but one of my colleagues at NEF is doing some modeling on how do we basically get things going and pushed in the right direction, get the retrofit money out the door um, and also kind of skill skill up at the same time um, because they go, you need one to do the other and then you need that one to do the other one. You, they, they need to be in concert. And at the moment, there is cash for there is some cash for retrofit. It's not nearly enough to meet what we need, but there is some cash. But for reasons that we've described um, on other areas, the money can't get out of the door because we don't have the skills and the people to do this this kind of work. Um, it's long term thinking, um, and it is it's painful. Um, but the answer to your question is no. Um, it's not something that I am an expert in. I know that the Federation of Master Builders are really kind of pushing this stuff hard as they should be because. It's absolutely right. We we don't have the construction skills, workforce. Um, and when the cost of materials have gone up so much as well, um, it does make it really expensive to build build homes at the moment. I would think surveyors was going to be an surveyors, absolute, yeah. absolute terrible bottleneck. Yeah. And nearly everything we're doing requires yeah. com competent, honest surveyors. Absolutely. And there's no quick fix. It takes no. time. Yeah. Okay, Sheila, you, you, you've got a question? And, and again, you're on mute, Sheila. No, it wasn't a question. I I just um, said that um, uh, I put in the chat that North Tyneside's been using regeneration um, in town centres as a way of bringing back houses, if the shops into use as houses, and vice versa, you know, increasing housing stock by by wanting to regenerate but we're, we're also just on the last point we're also very short of planners and we will be very short of architects as well um and it, it seems to me that one of the, the the big things we'll need to do is to look at um modern methods of construction building social housing um because it's it's much quicker we can train people up quicker um, and it will also be it, most of what I've heard about is it's very energy efficient as well. So I'm hoping that we can do that. I think that's so, right. I, I, I think I think anything that we can do to kind of rapidly upscale and get things moving in the right direction is is right. I mean, everything that I've seen about um, modern methods of construction suggests that we don't need to be too concerned about the standards and the quality. Um, particularly when it comes to things like energy efficiency, as you said. Um, the other thing that we need to bear in mind here is that um, the government has proposed rightly um, to introduce what's called the future home standard, which is raised and improved standards for, for energy efficiency in, in, in house building. And it's yet, and I don't claim to be an expert in this, there may be others on this call who are, but th that will almost certainly have implications for the construction industry because they're being asked to adhere to a whole new set of standards rightly so we can make, meet our carbon zero um, objectives, but but we can't pretend it's not there. There's people in the chat with second questions, but I wanted to give everybody the chance to ask a first question. Is, is, is there anybody who hasn't asked, the, hasn't asked the question who wants to jump in? No? Okay, okay, we can go back to um, second question. So, uh, Peter, you, you had a second question. I think I've got about 100. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's not so much, I mean, I've, obviously on the uh, MMC and the energy, sorry, this is on a further topic, but it's, on the MMC and the energy efficiency, I think it goes both ways. Um, I think we're becoming very good at insulating properties against the coal, but what we're quite bad at is... Um, protecting properties and homes from high, high levels of heat, et cetera, uh, as, and, and the more extreme weather conditions we're getting. And there's very little in terms of legislation on that at the moment. And a lot more needs to be done, for example, using passive solar control, et cetera. And yes, MMC can go some way to deliver that, but it also has its own problems as the industry has found out. Um, sorry, it's, just, it's more a comment than a, than a, than a question. 
Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. I've, I've, I've read some kind of quite worrying things about, you know, so up until recently, well, and, and including now, we, we tend to think in terms of the problem about keeping our houses warm. Um, you're absolutely right. There is a problem with keeping our houses cool, um, given given the kind of the climate crisis that we're facing. And we all, I will never forget, trying to live in a 40 degree house last for you know last summer or whenever it was it was horrific that that is unfortunately something we're going to have to learn to live with as a country and our housing stock is poorly equipped to deal with that as it is and it's poorly equipped to deal with our kind of relatively moderate winters you know we're not scandinavia <laughs> yeah, so, and then there's a real problem again with what you said earlier about um retrofitting uh, all, all the properties by insulating them and putting in double glazing where they had single glazing which was designed to be leaky and overcome some of those issues. And the heat gain from double glazing is, is intense. Uh, I know I live in a property that's had that, and I have to put three layers of curtaining on just to stop the heat coming through in summer yeah, uh, because there's no passive solar control. Yeah. Okay, so I, I can see John Bevin and then I can see Mick O'Sullivan. Ho hopefully I'm not missing anybody else on the screen. So John and then Mick. Yeah, so local housing allowance, raising local housing allowance to encourage private landlords to remain uh, letting out their various properties. Isn't that a slight, there's a double-edged sword there, isn't there? Because we're basically we're providing more money for private landlords, many of which are not providing good quality. And local authorities, they cannot put up their rents to get more money from the, the local housing allowance to tenants who claim it because the rents are more or less limited, the rent prices are limited. So is there is a sort of double-edged sword where we're providing more money for private landlords? Uh, yeah, to some extent, yes. I mean, first of all, there's a kind of the immediacy of um, the situation whereby if you freeze LHA in the way that we've done, whilst rents are going up 10 15% year on year, you are just drive, you know, government policy is effectively directly driving homelessness because people can't pay the pay the difference anymore. Um, so there is a kind of immediacy of the problem, which is about families staying in their in their homes. Um, and I think that that for me is the key point. The secondary point um is that the situation I was describing with temporary accommodation when local authorities have to discharge their their homeless families into the private rented sector. And because LHA has been frozen and rents have risen, they have to meet the financial costs of that. That that that's a huge burden on local government, which, as I said, is kind of driving some of them to the brink of uh, bankruptcy. That's the second problem. The third point, which I think you've you've actually kind of articulated really really well, actually, is that yeah, the trade off of that is that <laughs> you know taxpayers are subsidising private landlords again, and that is true. That that's the model that this country has adopted since we got rid of rent controls in the early nineteen eighties. Let let uh, let housing benefit take the strain was uh, George Young's line, and you know that's exactly what's happened. Um, so, is it a perfect solution? No. As with anything in housing, if you do just one thing, you will get unintended consequences. You have to do everything, and local housing to to upgrade local housing allowance right now is to put out the fire. It's not going to get you what you need to where you need to get to which is to ultimately drive down homelessness when people are made homeless to give them high quality temporary accommodation or permanent accommodation to live in. It doesn't resolve those issues. It just stops that family being made homeless right now uh, and stops that council being pushed to the financial brink right now. But I agree with you that the, the, the price with that, the price for that, the trade-off is that taxpayers are subsidizing some of the dodgiest private landlords again. Okay, if, if we go Mick and then Gerald. Hi, Alex. Hi, Mick. Good to see you. Uh, yeah, likewise. <laughs> um, just, uh, you mentioned retrofit. Are you checking out guys like um, uh, the Red Clock Co-op uh, and also uh, looking towards the Irish model? They've been doing retrofit for quite some time now and seems to work quite well. And the uh, derelict homes, they have schemes for derelict, uh, for re uh, <coughs> rebuilding derelict homes that might be worthwhile to look at. And this yeah. uh, vis your problem with heat uh, and cold, uh, I would have thought heat pumps work both directions. Might be a way to sort out that one. Uh, my main question, though, was uh, 
how do we persuade the uh, British developers to change their business model so they actually build ordinary homes, homes for ordinary people, rather than just the land hoarding that they currently engage in and effectively profiteering? Yeah, look, Great I mean, question, Nick. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. I'll, I'll deal with the retrofit one very quickly, which is to say I am not an expert in retrofit. One of my colleagues at NEF is, but he, but we're, we're kind of piloting, um, or he rather, is piloting a kind of scheme whereby working with local authorities about understanding how to actually roll it out. Um, so not, you know, I think we've won the, the argument about investing Check in it. Check out Charlie Baker from... Uh... Yeah, I'll, I'll pass that on to him. Um, yeah. But, but you know, the argument about we need to do this has been won. Ed Miliband said that we're going to spend, the Labour government will spend about £6 billion a year on it, which is great. The question is how you roll it out and linking that to, um, forgive me, whoever it was on the chat earlier who was talking about, it was Paul, I think, talking about skills um you know and, and answering that question um on the developer side um how do you get them to change their business model when fundamentally their business model has resulted in them reaping exorbitant profits and presiding over and contributing to the housing crisis good luck um in the current system because you're not going to because that's not the that's why would they they're, they're, in a way there's no point blaming them because why would they do anything else um, what we need to do... So, sorry, Alex, we, we, we can't blame them, but how can we control them? Sure, sure, sure. Um, well, what, what Labour have announced at conference is welcome. So giving or producing new statutory guidance to make really, really clear about when viability assessments can be used and how they can't be used and just providing a real clear legal framework for local authorities to use is good. Um, I'm slightly more sceptical about this kind of white hall kind of pool of knowledge that, that Labour talked about, as in like they, they said they were going to have a kind of central white hall body that, that local authorities can kind of ask questions about stuff. You know, fine. Um, squeezing the most out of out of developers is really, really important. And Labour also talked about recruiting much more, you know, planners and, and planners to local authorities. All of that's good. Um what it doesn't do is change the model. It does not change the model. It's just okay. trying to cream as much out of the existing model as possible, which is welcome. But what we have to do, and if we, what we have to do if we're going to get anywhere close to building 90,000 social homes a year, we're not, we're not going to have a hope in hell getting close to that unless we wean ourselves off of that developer model because, well, it's kind of self-evident. They're just, why, why they're, they're, they're not going to give us the units that we need and they're not going to give us the accompanying infrastructure that we need because we've seen that they they won't, and nor sh nor should they. That's not really their job. It is the job of the state ultimately, if it wants to do this stuff, to do it. And it's what we did in the past. So as again, with nearly every other aspect of housing policy, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have to look to how things were done well in the past. And the answer is, you mean sure squeeze as much from section one hundred six as you can. Great, go for it. Um, ultimately, you have to massively upscale, and the only way to upscale is through capital grants and infrastructure spending. You're not going to get close to it without that. And so I think it's about over time weaning ourselves off of this developer model in a way. And also one thing that, that um, colleagues at the Joseph Roundtree Foundation have talked about, which is I think is really, really interesting, they put out a paper on this last month, is about a state-backed master planner. Slightly different point, it's about new towns and, and kind of creating new places. But the idea that the state would basically have a set of public policy objectives, be it around sustainable places, affordable, how genuinely affordable housing, et cetera, et cetera. And seeing a project through, seeing a development through over the course of 10, 15, 20, 25 years plus in a way that a developer, they're not interested in that. Why would they be? They just want to build the home and sell it and reduce their obligations as much as possible. That's all they care about. So that kind of long-term stewardship, which is something that the Joseph Roundtree Foundation have talked about, I think is also a really, really important part of this. But we, but you're right, Mick, we just need to wean ourselves off of it. And G Gerald, there's the last question. Okay, yes, so I wanted to raise a, a big flag for rural housing. The There's a massive problem out there. I live in uh, North Dorset, um, and there's a hidden homelessness. Uh, people living in summer houses and in chalets and back gardens. Uh, um, uh, many of whom are not uh, where it's unknown by the local authority because they don't want the local authorities enforcement to force them out. There's huge issues of disrepair. A lot of the housing 
is old and and uh, in many cases covered by listed building uh, can issues. So a property becomes listed, but then uh, it, it, it then also becomes difficult to modernise uh, to some degree. There are issues over housing need and and it, and uh, if this with global warming there and other pressures, there's going to be the need to develop much greater a grow, grown at home agriculture, uh, despite modern farming methods, it still needs people to, to work on the land. Um, and I live in a village which still got lots of agricultural workers in it, uh, and they need somewhere to live. And um, the second homes is forcing those people out. And the res result of second homes is, of course, uh, they're empty. Uh, 90 90 percent of the year uh, and then not used um in wales they talk they've uh, brought in uh the the power as i understand it to increase council tax for second homes um what well, my view is we should be capable for local authorities should be capable not just doubling the council tax uh, in areas of need but uh, uh quadrupling it or or even greater in order is to support there's a lot there for Alex, so shall, shall we let Alex jump in and no, answer that? Really, really important point. So um, you've actually helped me, Gerald, Gerald to, to lead me on to one point which I wanted to make throughout the whole thing, but I haven't done so yet. So we've got a paper coming out next week which talks about property tax reform. And within that, it talks about some of the ideas that you're talking about. So increasing uh, council tax on holiday let, uh, second homes, empty homes, increasing um or abolishing the holiday lettings scheme because actually at the moment landlords are bizarrely incentivized to let out their properties as holiday lets rather than standard lets when what's that doing is just encouraging them to do so and it's driving down private rent and supply and pushing rents up so absolutely we need to get rid of that effectively but one of the other things which we really want to see and we've done some good modeling on and labor are, are quite interested in this stuff and other policy makers as well is increasing the stamp duty paid by both overseas investors and multiple homeowners. So those second homeowners that you're talking about, trying to nip some of their kind of buying power in, in, in the bud, as it were, and level the playing field a little bit more by raising their stamp duty. Very finally, a quick plug for that paper that's coming out. But we think that increasing stamp duty on overseas investors and um, multiple homeowners could raise up to five point and and also i should say um making uh landlords and other um people who receive property income pay national insurance which most most of them don't um that will could raise up to 5.7 billion pounds a year it could also hopefully deter some of that speculation that you're talking about gerald um and basically make it harder for them to to buy homes level the playing field with first time buyers and councils who want to buy those homes 5.7 billion quid isn't going to change the world but it's not a small amount of money um so there are things that we can definitely do in that space and rural areas are a really important battleground as it were uh, thanks alex I've, I've been watching people write in a way as you've been talking so you've absolutely kind of fired fired ideas at us tonight that's been absolutely fabulous so if we if we can give a virtual round of applause for alex thank you no i've really enjoyed it it was good to meet you all okay that's that's brilliant and a, a quick plug for 